Let us pray. Loving God, we pray that you will give us ears to listen, minds to understand, and hearts to love. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. <coughs> I think we might need a break after that long gospel. <laughs> so. One summer while I was in seminary, I did my required chaplaincy training or clinical pastoral education at the trauma center in downtown Austin. And I was assigned to the medical intensive care unit and to shadow Elizabeth, one of the staff chaplains. For the first couple weeks, we visited patients and their families together so that I could observe her and get feedback on my interactions. On one pastoral visit, I concluded with a prayer. And being totally new at this and not knowing any better, I prayed that God would completely heal this patient. But later, Elizabeth cautioned me about praying in this way with patients and their families, as oftentimes those hopes for healing would not come true. Our role as hospital chaplains was to be with them and to offer support, not to get hopes up by praying for a miracle. When we experience times of suffering, be it our own suffering or being with someone else in their pain, often we feel led to pray. And yet, just as much as we feel led to pray, equally, we may not be sure of how to pray or even what we should be praying for. How do we ask God to intercede for us or someone we care for in these times of intense need? In today's gospel from John 11, we hear of just such an emergent situation. Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha and friend of Jesus, is very ill. Mary and Martha send word to Jesus to come to Bethany so that he may heal their brother. But Jesus says Lazarus can wait. The disciples feel confused by Jesus' lack of urgency, and they seem surprised that Jesus' first impulse is to wait rather than to rush to his friend's bedside. By the time they arrive in Bethany, Lazarus had already been dead and in the tomb for four days. So when Jesus finally arrives, Martha confronts him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. In that moment, Jesus consoles Martha, telling her, your brother will rise again, reminding her, I am resurrection and I am life. Likewise, when Mary comes to see Jesus, she confronts him with the very same words, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus sees, hears, and feels her tears and of all those who gathered to mourn with them, he is greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. In that moment, even though he is resurrection and life, Jesus weeps along with them. In the midst of this swirl of intense emotions, Jesus approaches the tomb and commands them to remove the stone. To everyone's astonishment, when Jesus says, Lazarus, come out, he does. Lazarus died, was buried, and then is resurrected right before their very eyes a foreshadowing of what would happen to Jesus himself, but with even more vast and eternal implications. I wonder how each of us would respond in that situation. I wonder how we might pray and what we might pray for in that moment. And I wonder how we pray in our own lives when we experience suffering, conflict, and loss, and the grief and trauma that inevitably follow. I suggest that there are three ways that we might pray in the midst of suffering, our own, others, and the whole world's. Our first inclination is to want to pray as I did as a young, inexperienced hospital chaplain for healing or a miracle. In other words, to pray for resurrection. And it's not wrong to pray for that. And this is what Martha and Mary have in mind. It's what they're praying for, and it's why they're so disappointed and frustrated and angry when Jesus doesn't just drop everything, race over to Bethany, and heal Lazarus like they expected him to. It's the prayer behind their confronting Jesus when he did finally arrive on the scene. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. 
It's not wrong to want to pray for a miracle, be it healing or resurrection. Sometimes the miracle we pray for happens. And when it does, we feel simultaneously astounded and grateful. Here's what that kind of prayer sounds like. God, by the power with which you raised Jesus from the dead, restore this man in mind and body, make him himself again, and bring my friend the joy of companionship and the hope of a long and fruitful life with his family. But praying for a miracle, for the suffering or the trauma to disappear isn't the only way that we can pray. Here's a second way we can pray in the midst of overwhelming, painful, or challenging circumstances. In prayers of incarnation, we pray for God to be with us in the suffering. Martha and Mary asked Jesus to come not solely to heal Lazarus, but also to invite Jesus to be with Lazarus and with them in their time of need. Lord, if only you had been here. They are praying that Jesus will come be with them as soon as possible and are frustrated when Jesus doesn't arrive on their timeline. In prayers of incarnation, we pray that we'll be able to unmistakably sense God's comforting, strengthening, sustaining presence with us in the midst of whatever pain we're experiencing. Maybe that is through feeling God's divine presence directly, as when we sense in an undeniably vivid way that the Holy Spirit is with us even now. Or maybe it's through us feeling that God has sent someone to be with us, someone who will stick with us closely through it all, whatever befall. Here is what this prayer of incarnation might sound like. God and Jesus, you shared our pain, our foolishness and our sheer bad luck. You took on our flesh with all its needs and clumsiness and weakness. Visit my friends now. Give them patience to endure what lies ahead, hope to get through every trying day, and companions to show them your love. In this sort of prayer, we are interceding in the knowledge that God came to be with us, incarnate in Jesus, to live and die as one of us. So when we pray for someone or for ourselves in this way, We are praying that we will be strengthened and encouraged as we remember the ways that Jesus, too, experienced pain, disappointment, conflict, loss, and trauma. Knowing that Jesus himself needed companions and his suffering inspires us to come alongside people who need us to be with them, to be their companions in the way of suffering, their companions in the way of the cross. But there's still one more way we should consider praying, though admittedly it's not the prayer that we're apt to go to first. Upon hearing that Martha and Mary had sent for him, pleading for him to come be with the one he loves, Lazarus, we hear in Jesus' first response a nudge toward this third kind of prayer. This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. In Jesus' response that this illness does not lead to death, but rather that it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it, he is pointing to us toward a prayer that moves beyond asking for a miracle to take away the problem, a prayer that moves beyond asking for the strength and companionship to persevere. We hear Jesus pointing us toward a third way of interceding, which is praying for transformation or transfiguration. Praying that illness or conflict or loss or grief or trauma not be taken away and not merely be powered through, but rather (coughs) praying that this struggle will lead to God's glory. This is what we mean when we say we are praying for transfiguration. Just like when Peter, James, and John go up on the mountain to be with Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, seeing how brightly they shone there, experiencing a momentary glimpse of the divine essence, that that which goes on and on, transcending the bounds of earthly existence. Once we've experienced transfiguration or a glorification of our circumstances in a way that leads to transcendence, then we are forever changed. We cannot unsee it. 
Praying for transfiguration in the midst of suffering, pain, and struggle sounds something like this. God, in your son's transfiguration, we see a whole reality within and beneath and beyond what we thought we understood. In their times of bewilderment and confusion, show us your glory, that we may find a deeper truth to our lives than we ever knew, make firmer friends than we ever had, discover reasons for living beyond what we'd ever imagined, and be folded into your grace like never before. This is what we pray when we ask in the midst of suffering that the Son of God may be glorified through it, that we may be transformed in our faith in Christ as we turn to him in our suffering. We pray not expecting that the suffering be taken away, or even for the strength and companionship to persevere, though we can also pray those things. But in this third prayer, we pray expecting that we will be changed through our experience of suffering, that the way we respond and grow and are changed through these moments of challenge will glorify the Son of God. In these moments of suffering, we pray that we may be changed as our suffering allows us to glimpse the face of Jesus shining even more brightly, a glimpse of the light and love of God that is most clearly seen when we feel most overwhelmed by the darkness of suffering and hopelessness. As we reflect back on when, where, and how Jesus shows up to be with Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, not in the way they first asked or imagined, but in the way that would bring most glory to the Son of God, it is then that we learn something of how and why Jesus comes to be with us. As we conclude our reflections on this gospel story, I want you to think for a moment of a particular trial or tragedy that is causing you or someone you love very much to suffer. And holding this trial or tragedy in the forefront of your heart, mind, and spirit, let us pray. Loving God, we pray that you make this trial and tragedy, this problem and pain, a glimpse of your glory, a window into your world, when we can see your face, sense the mystery in all things, and walk with angels and saints. Bring us closer to you in this crisis than we ever have been in calmer times. Make this a moment of truth, and when we cower in fear and feel alone, touch us, raise us, and make us alive like never before. Amen. Amen.